happens. All right, next time it happens, I'll want to tell who you're supposed to put the battery in. All right, let's open to number 425. 425 in your songbook. 425. Hold the fort. 425. Hold the fort. And we'll sing. Get your uh, answer ready to wave back to Evan. All right. Number 425. A little loud tonight. I don't know why. Maybe it's me. All right. Please join me on that first verse. Number 425. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing. Victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will. See the mighty host advancing, Satan leading on. Mighty man around is falling, courage almost gone. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. See the glorious banner waving, hear the trumpet blow. In our leader's name we'll triumph over every foe. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander, cheer my comrades, cheer. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. Turn that down a little. I just think it's a little loud, but maybe it's me. All right. I don't know why. What's going on here? I see why. We can turn it all the way up. There we go. Is that better? All right. Somebody had it all the way up, so now we won't be hurting my ears or yours. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray to your God that you'd please bless the services tonight. I pray that you'd be with your dear people. I thank you for them, and I ask your God that they would receive a great blessing tonight. Please get the honor and glory for it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I got a couple of announcements here for you. Uh, please remember to turn off... The cell phones, they can be a, a very extreme distraction. Besides that, the, um, they, are, they can let loose with some things that you don't want to hear. And we don't want to hear in church, as, as has happened before. So um, please uh, make sure they're turned off and, we, and uh, appreciate that. All righty. Then we have prayer requests here. Um, pray for Tina Lord. This is the mother-in-law of Dan Horton, and she's been diagnosed with liver cancer, and so she has that along with the cirrhosis of the liver. So she needs our prayers. If you'd pray for her, um, then we have uh, also pray about the revival meeting. We're having special meetings. We're going to have our fall program starting here in about four weeks. And it'll be, the, the uh, culmination of it will be, uh, the final Sunday will be on October the 9th when Brother Grace here, he'll be preaching. And we want to have a big day that day, and then we're going to have uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'll have a time of preaching, and we'll have uh, special music here for you. So that'll be a blessing for everyone. So we'll be praying about that. That's an exciting time. And get involved in the spring program, or I'm sorry, the spring, <laughs> I'm behind the times, or ahead of the times, one of the two, but uh, be, a, be, um, be involved in the fall program, you're going to enjoy it. 
Um, we're going to have the decorations up here pretty soon, and uh, you'll know that I'll announce the theme and the contest, and you'll be able to win prizes, and you'll be able to also uh, be on a team and participate and help your team win. And we're going to try to get, see people get in church, get saved, get uh, baptized, and that's our goal to reach people with the gospel. So be praying about that and get involved. You'll have a blessed time. So let's see. Did I miss anything? Oh, Mrs. Uh, Gray, uh, Brother Gray's wife, is not doing real well. She's having a real lot of trouble with her, um, uh, her memory and stuff. And she had too many strokes last Thursday. She's out of the hospital. She has scheduled appointments with the neurologist and the uh, urologist. So she's having trouble in a lot of ways, a lot of fronts there. So if you'd pray for her. And Brother Gray, we'd appreciate it. Um, he's uh, he's resting up from his weekend. Uh, he was traveling a lot there preaching. So i um, be praying for them if you would. That's the prayer request I have to announce. The others are in the bulletin. If you'd like to have your prayer request announced, there are these prayer slips on the track rack. When you come in the door and look to your left, you'll find these prayer slips. Fill one out. Get it to me. And uh, we'll pray for it. If you want it announced, make sure you mark the box announced. If it's not marked, I won't announce it. I'll assume it's a private request, and I won't uh, to share it with anyone. So make sure if you want it announced, to check that box, announce. All right? We have uh, two memory verses for the week. We're going to read those out loud at this time. And they're in your Bible, found on page 1. 39 of your New Testament, if you have one of those pew Bibles there in front of you, or you have a presentation Bible. Otherwise, it's in the bulletin or on a green slip of paper that uh, you might have picked up when you came in the front door. We have the bulletins there. And so, and we'll read that out loud three times together. And that is John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. All right, let's read it out loud three times together. Ready? John 6, 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? John 6, 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? John 6, 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? All right, that will do you good and help you too. Memorize scripture. It will be a great blessing to you, and we have a uh, great opportunity. Now, don't forget Saturday soul winning at 10 a.m. Love to have you out for that. And then, of course, start your week off right with Sunday morning. Be here at 945. Start church with us. All righty. Um, we are glad to have a visitor with us tonight. And uh, this is Sandy, and she came. She lives in the area. Um, you just saw our sign, or... Read about us in the paper or what? Well, good. Good, amen. We're glad you came, amen. And we tr trust you'll be blessed tonight. Thanks for stopping in. That's wonderful, amen. I'm glad everyone else is here too, by the way. <laughs> so we're glad you all came. And it's uh, good to have a little bit cooler weather, isn't it? Amen. And uh, we, though, and the rain is good. We needed some rain. Um, we are blessed to have some rain to help get things growing again. All right, number 229 in your songbook, if you would. Number 229. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Number 229.
Please join me on that first verse of number 229. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, a day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. On that third now, now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. Good singing. Why don't you stand and stretch your legs and greet each other with a friendly hey, howdy, hey, and uh, turn around and say hi to your neighbor, in other words, and welcome. Amen. Good to see you all. I'm glad you made it out tonight. Amen. All right. Time for our love offering. This will go to help uh, someone who's in full-time service that God uh, directs us to. Give it to, so if you'd pray about that and what God would have you to help, I appreciate uh, you folks helping. Um, we have uh, been able to be a blessing because of your willingness to give. So thank you for that. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful how you bless us. And Lord... It's also a great blessing when you bless us so that we can pass it along to others. Help us work in our hearts. Help us to be a blessing to someone. We ask you to guide us to that person who has a need that's in full-time service for the Lord. Please, get all the honor and glory for it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, while you're doing that, if you'll turn over to number 344. Number 344. Higher ground, 344. Please join me as we sing, starting on that first verse, the number three, four, four. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, 
Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. On that fourth, I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Good singing tonight. Open your Bibles, if you would, please. Get into the Bible study here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Oh, I didn't give you your word of wisdom for tonight. I mean, your word of knowledge, uh, tongue-in-cheek joke there. Uh, Mr. Smith was a very busy traveling salesman. He flew everywhere. And so he was very careful to mark his luggage. He didn't want it lost or someone taking it by mistake. So he was very careful about that since he had experienced a lot of lost luggage and things like that. He had ribbons and, and fluorescent tape on it and everything, and uh, he, he uh, did that so that, you know, there'd be no confusion. Well, one day he was quite surprised as he was waiting at the, you know, the turnstile, you know how the luggage comes down out of the airport. He was quite surprised to see a, a well-dressed man um, pick up his luggage and walk out with it. He followed the guy, and he tapped him on the shoulder and says, I believe that that luggage is mine. Or did you mark your bags with tape like I do? Actually, the man replied, I was wondering who had marked my bags this way. All right, anyway. That wasn't that funny, was it? All right. <laughs> Amen. The funny part is I told it. Amen. All right. <laughs> if you haven't opened your Bibles, open them up and turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And I want you to look at the famous verses 8 and 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, page number 283 in that pew Bible in the New Testament. It's in front of you, page 283. And look down there, if you would, at those two verses I mentioned, verses 8 and 9, Philippians chapter 4. All right, if you found us, amen. amen. All right. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. A very famous uh, two verses in the Bible, and we're going to start off there. We are talking about in our series. I've been. I started a series of lessons uh, last week on Bible logical Christian living. I'm giving you. Um, I've been in the ministry 30 years now, and I'm giving you what I've learned from the Bible, from experience. And a lot from what I learned from my former pastor, my wife and I's former pastor who's in heaven, Dr. Jack Hiles. Um, you'll learn a lot by observing, after you've read the Bible and prayed, observe 
the lives of great Christians, either through reading the Bible, or I'm sorry, reading biographies about them, or by um, knowing them personally. And you'll learn a lot uh, in always referencing back to the Word of God. Make sure you have the Word of God as your foundation. So I'm, I'm trying to pass along uh, what I call Bible logical Christian living. Last week, we talked about prayer. I hope you took the prayer challenge. Not last week, I'm sorry, we skipped a week because of camp. We had a youth camp, we had the service out there last Thursday. But So it's been two weeks now since we did our, and I won't go through a review because I've got a lot to cover tonight, but I would just briefly encourage you, if you didn't take that Bible challenge, and if you didn't see it or you need the outline of the 30-minute prayer challenge I gave you, just go to YouTube and type in Pastor Kevin J. Miller. Pastor Kevin J. Miller. I made it public. It's online. And I keep our, our, our sermons are unlisted here on the day of preach them. I want everybody to be in church. I want somebody to have an excuse not to be here. Unless they're really sick, then I'll give them the link. Or they have some reasonable explanation. So, but... Uh, then after that, now when I've started a policy, what we do is we'll make them public after uh, we've preached them here, after I've preached them. So it is public, and it's Pastor Kevin J. Miller's, our YouTube channel, and you can find the sermon there. It would be, it would be uh, August the 4th. August the 4th is where you'll find that sermon on prayer. So I challenge you, if you haven't done it, Take the 30-minute prayer challenge, the 30-minute prayer challenge, and get that outline off YouTube if you don't have it already, and write it down of a good starting point for prayer. Now, back to Ephesians chapter, or Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We're talking about schedule. Now, when I say that word schedule, you, you have in mind verses 8 and 9 of of uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And so uh, you think, well, what, what does that have to do with, um, what does that have to do with uh, the lesson tonight? Well, Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, I want you to do what you've seen and have been taught by me. Paul was saying, listen, God doesn't want the preacher to live one way and the people to live another. And more people will either succeed or fail at the Christian life because of their understanding of priorities. Their understanding of priorities. So when it comes to schedule, it's very under, important we understand priorities. We understand Bible priorities. Not our priorities, but Bible priorities. Now, we have a Bible that's preserved, inspired words of God. And it is relevant because it's an eternal book. And so all we need to do is look at the scriptures to learn the priorities. And to tell you the truth, um, a lot of the problems in Christian life could be solved just simply by having a schedule based on the right priorities. It could solve a lot of problems. We have folks that misunderstand priorities. We forget sometimes that the Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. You see, we have a line of thinking. Every human being does. We have an old nature. And that line of thinking is such that if we're not careful to examine the scriptures and be led of the Spirit, we will have our own priorities, our own way of thinking. And God says, I've got priorities already laid out for you. I already have it laid out in the Bible, the priorities that you need. And I'm going to give you some examples of this tonight from the Bible. And we have to realize that most of us, not every one of us here, but most of us 
have more things that we're supposed to do than we have time to do. Anybody relate to that? Of course you can. We have, you know, not everybody's like that. And I, I envy the person that's not in that position. There are some that aren't in that position for various reasons. But most of us have more to do than we'll ever find time to do it. And it's easy for us to get out of order because when you look at our list of things to do, um, we have to be very careful because all of a sudden there are things that grab our attention. And look at Second Peter, if you would. Second Peter, chapter number one. Second Peter, chapter number one. And look down, <coughs> excuse me, at verse six. You'll find something interesting here. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. And it says, it's page 332, by the way. Back up to verse 5. I, I don't know why I wrote 6, but it's verse 5 I want to start at. Page 331 in your New Testament. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence and to your faith, I'm sorry, add to your faith virtue. Now look what it says there. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Now, virtue is uh, one way of, of saying character. Character is something that comes from good virtue, or virtue comes from good character. In other words, Paul, or Peter here, is saying there's an order to the Christian life. God has it laid out. Now remember, he wrote this on the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God. This is inspired words of God. He says, add to your faith virtue. So your faith is, uh, is what comes first. You get born again. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then the next step is adding virtue to that. And then it says to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. So, uh, Peter lays out an order. God has an order. God doesn't uh, expect you, I'll make a statement, it's going to alarm you, but he doesn't expect you to get everything done in life that comes into your life. Okay? Now, bear with me. I know that you, don't, you, uh, you sound like, uh, you, you may think I'm contradicting myself when I say about doing God's will and we're supposed to do everything God has put before us. And Paul said, I have finished my course and, and, uh, and et cetera. But God doesn't, see, there are things that come into your life that are not on God's list of priorities, okay? You have to realize that. And God doesn't expect you to do those things. He expects you to do what's prior, priority for him that he gives you. And the most of the sin that a Christian will commit is because they do good at the wrong time. Doing good at the wrong time. You see, there are a lot of good things we can do in this life, but if we leave undone what God has for us to do, we've been disobedient, haven't we? There, there's a lot of good things, you know. Um... I'll give you an example on top of my head here, real quick. Uh, is, uh, we have good, well-meaning, sincere Christians who, uh, I had a, a boss, and he, he, he would go on mission trips. He came back one time and said, boy, we fed this many people, we, we drilled two or three wells, they got water, fresh water and everything, and I asked him a question. I said, how many people got saved? How many people are going to heaven now? How many people did you witness to? He was shocked. He thought, and he wasn't hurt. I wasn't trying to hurt his feelings. He realized, you know what? We forgot the most important thing. Those people are lost and on their way to hell. All we did was give them water and food. They're going to go to hell uh, with their thirst quenched and their bellies full. <laughs> Some of them are going to die and go to hell because they never were given the gospel. See, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. They sinned at what they did. They did good. Yeah, it was good. I'm glad they gave them water and food. But they didn't give them the gospel. They didn't share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And those things happen all the time to Christians. We have to be careful. All, any of us can fall into the trap. 
It's very easy for us to do. We look at this good thing we need to do. This is good. We got to do this. But if we don't do what God says is the priority, we get in trouble. Here's another one. Um, a lot of times uh, we had uh, uh, young people get their lives messed up at Hiles Anderson College. Young married couples would get their lives messed up. You know why? Because the fellow would be going to Bible college and he'd be involved in a ministry and he'd be working a job all at the same time. And you know what? Before he knew it, he was out soul winning when he should have been on a date with his wife. The next thing you know, there's marital problems. You see, now was it wrong for him to go soul winning and soul winning a lot? No. It's not wrong to go soul winning, but if you neglect God's priorities, you commit sin, you see. You got to be very careful. And, and lo and behold, some marriages have broken up because of that. Because doing good made us neglect the priority. So very, very easy for us to get out of order. And it's very easy to do good and yet be sinning while we're doing it. Because we're neglecting what God says is a priority. Paul said, if you recall, everything ought to be done decently and what? In order. Remember what he said to Timothy? Set things in what? Order. God is a God of order. God is a God of priorities. And you need to remember this. Get this statement. Important things will never clamor for your time. Some of you have been alive long enough to know that. But you young people, and you that don't know this yet, get it. Important things will never clamor for your time. Important things will never clamor for your time. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the little things that distract you, right? You've been alive long enough to know this. It's the little things that will distract you. It will keep you from doing the most important things. It's very easy to happen. Um, and God never comes down and says, all right, I demand four hours of you. But what is one of the most important things a Christian can do? The thing he was created for, right? To fellowship with God. But God doesn't come down and demand that you, he doesn't come down and get in your face and say, I need to spend time with you. And that's one of the most important, that is the most important thing, let me put it that way, that a Christian can do, is spend time alone with God. That's what your life is based upon. That's the success of your life is based on. So we have to realize, hey, <laughs> you know, the important things don't clamor for my time. You know, the doctor doesn't call me up and say, Kevin, you need to show up for your appointment. It's very important that you have that echocardiogram. He doesn't say that. And that's important. It's important. So it's the little things that will distract you. They'll, they'll, they'll clamor for your time. This detail, that detail, that detail. All right? Now, I have no one that's my boss. Contrary belief, somebody said well, to my wife one time, well, you're the pastor's wife. They were trying to get something changed in the church. You're the pastor's wife. And uh, she says, well, I'm not the pastor. <laughs> He's the head of the church. He's the over-shepherd, or whatever you want to call him, or he's the bishop, he's the overseer, uh, whatever Bible term you want to use, the pastor. He's the one. I don't have a boss. I have to answer to something else. There's no one over me. And that someone is, has to be a schedule. The thing is, we got this idea that successful people are just lucky. Successful people aren't lucky. Successful people are scheduled people who have prioritized their life. You find anyone that's a successful entrepreneur and ask them how they became successful. Were you just lucky? <laughs> They'll tell you, no way, Jose. They worked, they scheduled, and they prioritized. That's how they became successful. We, we've got this mentality, and I think it all stems from this entitlement mentality we, in society we live in now, that they just got lucky and they ought to share it with everybody. No, they worked hard. They scheduled. They prioritized. That's how they became successful. 
Now granted, you probably bring two or three exceptions to me of someone you know inherited a million or whatever or just happened to fall into something, but that's not the rule. The exception does not make the rule. So the schedule, what we ought to learn, is the schedule ought to be our boss. The schedule ought to be our boss. Sister Dee, would you get anything done in home care if you didn't have a schedule? <laughs> You wouldn't, would you? <laughs> you'd lose your mind, is that what you say? Yeah, you'd lose your mind. That's about it. You know, you, you have to have scheduling. So what I want to give you is five things tonight, and what I'm going to dwell on a while, and you're going to think, well, that doesn't have a lot to do with scheduling, and it doesn't in a sense, but it'll help you with the schedule. I'm going to give you five things. You can write them down, and it's, a, it's five things, and those things will how to schedule how to have a schedule. How to have a schedule. Now the first thing we do on our schedule, and, not, and now this point's going to be quick, so get it down, but they're not all going to be quick. Point number two takes about two hours and 35 minutes, all right? You didn't mean that. I'm just kidding. But uh, it takes longer than the others. But point number one is make a list of obligations and responsibilities. Make a list of obligations and responsibilities. You can write this down, you guys, you know. Uh, write, you know. Make a list of obligations and responsibilities. If you don't have a pen and paper, uh, watch the video tomorrow when it becomes uh, public and write this down. But we need to make a list of obligations and responsibilities. There are, are obligations. Help me out tonight. Uh, get, somebody give me an obligation. Or responsibility you have. Name one. Nobody has responsibility. All right. <laughs> You're that whole group of people I was talking about that has plenty of time left over, don't you? You don't have anything. Okay. Uh, anybody help me out? Anybody? Yes. Church. What? Church. Church. Okay. That's an obligation and responsibility. God says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. Anybody else have an obligation and responsibility? Uh, yeah, Brother Daniel. What do you say? Work around the house. You got you got a maintenance of your home, right? House cleaning, etc. Uh, yes, soul winning. Yes, that's another one. Yes, the Bible says, "Go ye therefore and preach the gospel." Um, so, anybody else have one that wants to help me out? How about a wife? How about a husband? How about children? These are responsibilities. How about prayer? <laughs> Surprised you didn't say prayer. You must have not have taken the prayer challenge, did you? All right, you're telling on yourselves. All right, you're telling on yourselves. Uh, prayer, that's a, a Bible reading, right? Bible reading. Um, uh, uh, anything else? Anybody, have I got your mind going now? Yes. Okay, he's got a responsibility to take care of his dogs. Yes. Yes. What? Church events, okay, yeah, all right. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, so I think you got the idea there. We need to make an a list of obligations and responsibilities, all right? Now, the second thing you do is you sit down and look, in that, look at that list and put it in the order of priority according to the Bible. The order of priority according to the Bible. Um... Let me use uh, myself for an example. In the Bible, a pastor is called, uh, you know, is called a bishop, an elder, or a pastor in the Bible. Now, it's interesting. In order for me to understand my responsibilities as a pastor or my priorities as a pastor, is what we're talking about here now, priorities, is to understand what that means. Now, Bishop means what? Anybody know? Happen to know? What's that mean? I said it already, so if you were listening, you caught it, and you're going to... What? I can't hear you. No. Nope. Bishop means what? What's the meaning of the word? Bishop means what? Overseer. Overseer. All right? So, bishop means overseer. So, the Bible doesn't do anything by accident. It refers to a pastor by the, three, the different titles because... Uh, the people are supposed to know and the pastor is supposed to know what his responsibilities are. I'm supposed to oversee the church. That's what I do. I have to oversee every aspect of the church. That's my responsibility. 
Um, that doesn't mean I do everything. That means I oversee. <laughs> you know, in a small church, a pastor does a lot of the things. But as the church grows, there's going to be more to oversee. And hopefully you have more people involved doing things. And I'm simply overseeing those things. Like Mrs. Horton around, she's decorating. She's getting the decorations ready for fall and for the fall program. She conferred with me about it. I'm not doing the decorating. I might help with some of them. But um, I'm not doing the decoration. That's what she's doing. And so I'm overseeing that. Okay? Um, and she, I give her guidelines. And she asks me questions about what I'd like and what this and that. I'm just overseeing it, you see. And that's how it is in a church. The, the pastor is an overseer. He oversees the finances. I, I'm responsible to make sure the bills are paid. If the bills aren't paid, it's a reflection on Christ, it's a reflection on A.V. Baptist Church, and it's a reflection on me. So I have to oversee to make sure the bills are paid. If we, if we get a point where we have a financial secretary, it'll be my responsibility to make sure that financial secretary is sending out the checks on time to the right places, and et cetera, et cetera. We don't have one of those yet, but hopefully someday we will as we grow. And so um, it's, our respons it's my responsibility. It's some, there's a couple of the things I oversee. The Bible says it's also called an elder. He's called an elder. Now, that word elder, it, it, it means someone who's, who's more experienced, for instance. Like I said, I've been in the ministry 30 years. I've pastored this church now for, in October 23rd, it'll be, I lost track, 17 years. I had to subtract there. 17 years. So we have uh, the, I have some experience I may not be older than other people, but I have experience in the ministry. So, and as an elder, what does an elder do? He counsels people. People come to me and ask advice. They ask my counsel. That's one of my priorities. And then I also called a pastor. What's a pastor? What's a pastor? What's it mean, the word pastor? He's a what? Jesus Christ was the good shepherd, right? So a pastor is a shepherd, a shepherd. So what's that mean? I have the care of the flock. I'm supposed to care for the flock. How does a pastor care for the flock? I come to your house. I cook your breakfast in bed, right? I make you lunch and stuff, right? That's what a pastor does, care for the flock. Everybody's going, amen. All right, I'll be at my house tomorrow. No, that's not what I do. A pastor cares for the flock in the spiritual realm. I prepare spiritual meals, you say. I prepare Bible studies that will feed you and help you learn and help you grow as Christians. Sometimes I have to reprove. Sometimes I have to rebuke. Sometimes I have to exhort. Sometimes I encourage. Um, all different. It's all in the Bible. I have to do all those things. I have to help you grow. In other words, I have to protect you. Shepherd protect. All right? That's why I, I, I preach against sin. I don't want people to have sin in their lives. Why? Because it hurts you. It hurts me. Sin hurts people. Sin destroys people. So it's my job to preach against sin, to protect people, to keep them from being hurt. Because if I care about people, I don't want them to be hurt by having sin in their life. Um, I have to protect you from worldliness. I, I want the world to stay outside those doors, you see. And we have to... Uh, it, it, uh, my fr good friend told me that, a, that a, ch a church is like a ship. And a ship is always rescuing people. It's a rescue ship, and they're rescuing people. They're bringing them out of the ocean. And when those people come into the ship, they bring some water with them. And they get water on the floor of the ship, and that water starts to fill up the hold. So the pastor bails it out. That's his job, to bail that out. Because new Christians don't will bring that worldliness in with them, you see. They don't know. That's... that's why they get saved. That's why God wants them to get saved, so they can learn. And so the pastor's bailing the water out. So that's what a shepherd does. So based on that, I have to prioritize. I have to prioritize. So my first priority when it comes to pastoring, I'm not talking about my whole life now, I'm just talking about the pastoring aspect. My first priority is as a pastor, as a shepherd. To feed the flock, to protect them, and, and etc. So that's my first priority. 
The second priority is, is uh, uh, it would be uh, counseling you to help you when you have problems and stuff when you come to me. And then my next priority is overseer to make sure things are run right. So I hope that helps you understand you need to prioritize also. You need to do it according to the Bible. Look over at uh, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to help you with some more examples here. Um, Genesis chapter 2, and look down at verse number 8. Oh, page 2 in your Old Testament. And it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And so here we have, we have a man in the garden. And then we look down at verse number 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So Adam watches God perform creation here. And God makes the animals and Adam names them. Did you know, I'm going to tell you something profound. You ready for this? I'm going to write it down. Adam was the smartest man in the world. He was the only man in the world. All right, that was profound, wasn't it? All right, so, uh, I hope you wrote that down. All right, so, we have Adam. So, he gave names to all the cattle. All right? And so, here's, here's Adam. He sees, he sees a, 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 a bull and a cow. He sees a, a, a male horse and a female horse. And he sees a... A male hippo and a female hippo, and etc. He goes right down through the line. He's naming all these creatures. And look at verse number 20, the last part of the verse. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. So Adam is like, well, God, what's going on here? Everybody has a, you know, a counterpart here. Where, where, what about me? What about me? Look at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, God, it says, made a, what, what does it call, what, are they, what does God call Eve? He calls Eve a help meet, right? He calls Eve a help meet. So here, we see God giving us the divine order. Look at 1 Corinthians now, chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So God says, here's a divine order. God made woman out of man for man. Okay? Now, this is not politically correct where I'm going right now, but it's Bible. All right? So um, enjoy the Bible. If you're, not, if you're politically correct and you don't like where I'm going, you better just enjoy the Bible now. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just a messenger. But the Bible has a divine order. God made woman for man from a man. So he took a rib and made woman. So, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <coughs> excuse me, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. But now I praise you, I'm sorry, there's no but there. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Paul's saying, listen, I'm following Christ, and I've tried to set an example, and so follow this example. And he says, verse 3, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. All right? Now, like you said, it's not politically correct, but it's Bible. I've not been known to be politically correct. Why? Because I follow the Bible. The Bible says that the head of the woman is the man. And so we see God created a woman to complete a man. She's a help meet for him. 
You notice the Bible carries that theme there where it says, and the man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, right? You've heard a term, leave and cleave. They become what? One flesh. All right? They are partners now. They are uh, what God intended, man to be completed by a woman. A man is not complete without a wife. That's just the Bible. All right? So she's a help meet for him. She's perfect for him, in other words. She is just what God wants for the man to have to be complete. And, you know, the Bible says here now that the head of the woman is the man. So here we see a priority, a priority. And we have to follow God's priorities. Many a marriage has been destroyed when a woman has made the children a priority over the husband. Oh, but children are important. We've got to protect the children. Of course we do. But we've gotten things out of order in our society. It's not children first, ladies. It's husband first. You'll do yourself well. You'll do your children well to learn Bible principle. It's husband first, not children first. Many a marriage has been destroyed because it was children first. Sometimes it's the husband that puts children first and ruins the marriage. But it's not generally so because the woman usually spends the most time with the children and is the caregiver and is better at it. And that's usually what happens. We have to be very, very careful. There's a divine order. You know, it's a sin. The Bible teaches it's a sin not to be what God intended us to be. All right? It's a sin. We're supposed to be what God intended us to be. And so we are to realize we're to please God. We're to please God. So look what it says there in verse uh, 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For there, that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was a man created for the woman. Now Paul's reinforcing uh, 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 Genesis and he, Genesis chapter 2, and it says, uh, Neither was a man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Whereas the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God, the woman is made for the woman, so for the man. So he reinforces what we're taught in Genesis chapter 2, that God has made the woman for the man. So here's the order. It's very clear. The order for a woman is her husband. That's a priority on her list. Is he cared for? Is he take, is, you know, et cetera. That goes on the list as a priority. Um, look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, page 287. Let uh, the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, saying with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever ye do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, we see the, the Bible reinforcing again. The woman is to submit herself to the husband. Now, the thing I want us to focus on now is verse 20. Children, obey your parents 
in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. In all things. Notice that, all things. Children, you are commanded by God to obey your parents. This is another thing that has messed up our society. We've got this thing, children are so important, they're, they should be allowed to do anything to do. Positive reinforcement. Everybody gets a trophy just for showing up and all that kind of craziness that's going on. Um, no, children are to submit. They're to submit to their parents. They're to obey their parents. Their, their, their will is supposed to be their parents' will as long as they're children. Now, it didn't say adult children. It says children. That means as long as you're a child, and in other words, underage, and you're in your parents' care, perhaps you're 19, 20, 30, oh, no, not 30, just kidding, 19 or 20, 21, 22, whatever, and you're still on your parents' roof and your parents are caring for you, taking care of you, providing for you, you are to obey your parents. You obey your parents. And so, in all things, but you'll notice something if you look back at verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. As it is fit in the Lord. Now here, the woman has a, a different parameters than a child has. She's supposed to obey the Lord as it's fit. The child has to obey in all things. The woman, as it is fit in the Lord. In other words, if her husband wants her to violate scripture, she can't do it. She doesn't have to obey him. Just one example. Like if her husband says, all right, we don't need that child. That was an accident. You go get an abortion. He's an unsaved man. He's ungodly. And the wife's saved. And she says, no way, Jose. That's murder. I'm not going to do that. You see what I'm saying? That's fit in the Lord. And another thing that's fit in the Lord is this verse that probably popped in your head. Husbands and wives are to submit what? One unto what? Another. A lot of people have a hard time reconciling that verse with wives submit yourselves to your husbands. Now, how can you do both? How can a, a, a wife submit to a husband at the same time though a husband is supposed to submit to a wife? Well, this verse helps us as is fit in the Lord. So what's Paul leaving? He's leaving exception for when the husband submits to the wife. There are some things that a husband submits to the wife. Well, how do you know which ones? Well, it's whichever ones our wives tell us, amen? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like that guy, that joke I told that one day. What was that when I was trying to remember that joke? He, they were in line. See, in, 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 uh, they were two lines, one that, that uh, su submitted to their wives. Or, or No, how did that go? I forget how the joke went. Oh, one who wore the pants in the family and one, whose wife wore the pants in the family and one line for the husband that wore the pants in the family. And one guy was standing in the line and, uh, and, it's, and he's, the line it said, men who wore the pants in the family. And he got in that line. And the guy knew, the, the director there in charge of, the, of this whole thing said, I know that your wife wore the pants in the family. Why are you in this line? He said, because my wife told me to get in this line. But anyway, so... <laughs> um, no, how do we know where, where a husband's supposed to submit to a wife, you know? Because the Bible makes it very clear many times that a wife is supposed to obey the husband, that the, the, they're supposed to submit to the husband, they're, supposed to, they're made for the husband. How do we know? The man determines that. Okay? Um, some men will put their wife in charge of the finances. Now, any man that does that better do the right thing. If he's going to say, you're in charge of the finances, then he better submit to his wife. When she says, you can only spend this much money, he better obey her. Because he chose to put her in charge of it, you see. Now, I'm not saying he has to, but some men decide to do that, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Some women, and most women will say most women, but some women are better at finances than men. That's just the way it is. And the man that's wise, who realizes he's got a submissive wife, will say, hey, she's better at finances than I am. She's going to be in charge of the finances. And you'll be ahead. Now, if, if, uh, if all she can do is, uh, is, is grab the credit cards with her, with her friend and go, charge, and head for the store, you know, <laughs> 
you don't want to put her in charge of the finances. But there's nothing wrong with having the wife in charge of the finances. You know, one of the things that's good to have the wife in charge of is the home and decorating it. Women are a whole lot better at that than men. Uh, come on. <laughs> you got to admit it, fellas. <laughs> They're a whole lot better at it than men. You, you put them in charge of that. You put them in charge. Uh, Brother Hiles said one time, I remember, never forget, he was talking about how to, uh, we were having a Saturday night class, and he was talking about uh, that marriage that it was for the Saturday night class, if you're not familiar with it, I don't think I've ever told you about it. But on Saturdays, every, every uh, twice a month, on a Saturday night, Brother Howells would meet with the men that wanted to. We could go there to the main auditorium at the church, and he would meet with just the men for what was called the Saturday night class. And he was teaching us about how to treat our wives properly one semester. And I'll never forget, he's telling the story about how he put his wife in charge of decorating the house. He said, Mrs. Hiles can decorate it however she wants. I will never say anything negative about it because she's in charge of it. And she does a whole lot better job than I ever would. He says, so, he says, so you understand what that means? If she decided to put the couch in front of the, the front door and I walk in the front door and I fall over the couch and land on the couch, I won't complain. He said, I'll say, well, praise God. She knew I'd be tired and she put the couch right where it'd be handy. <laughs> And that's the way he lived. She was in charge of it. He submitted to that. She said, she, one day she told him, he was telling us in a Saturday night class, he said, she said, Jack, we need some new chairs. He says, all right, we'll go to the store and get some chairs. Next day or two, she comes back to him and says, I found some chairs I really like, but I want you to run down to the furniture store and look at them and see what you think and come back and tell me. He says, okay, I'll run down to the furniture store and uh, I'll drive down to the furniture store, I should say, and, and, and I'll come back and tell you what I think of them. So he gets in his car, he drives down to the furniture store, he drives around the outside of it and comes back and walks in the door and says, what do you think of the chairs? And he says, I love them. Now he didn't tell her he'd look at the chairs, he told her he'd drive down to the furniture store and come back and tell her what he thinks. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because he's submitting to her. That's her area. He doesn't, you know, by the way, this will solve a lot of marital problems if people would learn to do this. Let her have her area and submit to her. And you have your area and she submits to you, you see. I'm giving you some tips here that will save some marriages. Teach your, your young people. Teach your, 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 your grandchildren these ideas. You'll save a lot of heartache if you have areas of responsibility and areas of submission. Um, that's why uh, a man should never be, you know, usually the woman's in charge of the food. A man should never complain about what she sits in front of him. He should submit to her. Save a lot of problems. Well, I just don't like that. Well, find a way when she asks to tell her you're allergic to onions. <laughs> I didn't tell my wife when I, she made something with onions in it. I didn't say to her, How dare you make something with onions? You know I'm going to die if I eat those onions, you stinking woman. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> you see, there are tactful ways to do things and tactful ways to submit. We have to realize that there are priorities. So I hope I've helped you with that. Um, so the priority is the man, the woman, the children obey. Um, so now where was I? Okay. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Look at verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye 
shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be even, and, I'm sorry, and he shall be. Even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of a God. See, God sets up the divine order. God sets a divine order. And here he did it with Moses. And with marriage, he did it there. So that helps us understand our priorities when we are making our schedule. We are making a priority. Um, it would be wise for a, for instance, a, uh, a wife to say, all right, it's a priority. I'm supposed to take care of my husband and my children. That uh, means I'll cook for them. Now, this is in the general household. Now, I'm not aiming this at any particular household. I'm just saying in the general household. So the woman's cooking. Her responsibility is to cook some meals for the family. Now, she decides that's not a priority. She says, all right, I'll put that way down on my schedule. Um, that'll be like number 10 on the list. I'll do my nails. I'll do my makeup. That'll be one and two. I will make sure my show clothes are clean. That'll be three, um, you know, and et cetera. She puts all these things on a list, and she puts number 10, feeding your family, cooking food for them. You think that's going to make a happy home? <laughs> no. You see, I, I think you're getting the sense of it. So number one, make a list of obligations and responsibilities. Number two, put an order of priority according to the Bible. Look in the Bible for the priorities. Number three, give to each, give to each the time that it requires on the schedule. Now this is where, if you've never done a schedule, if you're, like you're a young person and it's new to you, it's going to be a little bit of trial and error here. You're going to have to uh, make some adjustments. You may say, well, it only takes me an hour to do that, and it takes you an hour and a half. Well, you have to correct. You have to adjust, you see. Because you're new at it, or you don't know. Or there's something new that's a priority that come in your life. And so you'll have to adjust. Or maybe as you get more experience, it takes less time. Okay, and that's hopefully what happens. Usually it does with most people. They grow in grace. And so same things take less time. So you can change your schedule and say, well, it used to take me an hour. I don't need that full hour. I can go back to a half hour. And you add things into your life. And you can do more. You can go further down the priority list. You see, you've got a list of priorities. For instance, um, it's not a priority for me as a pastor and a father and a working, doing secular work and everything. It's not a priority for me to, to correspond a lot with people that I would like to correspond with. That's not a priority. I've got preacher friends and people I'd like to write letters to and stuff or answer letters or whatever. That's not a priority because I have all these other priorities that have filled up my time. Now, if, if I get better at certain things or time I get where I can do those and I can add, that's down on my priority list. Maybe that will eventually get added in. You see what I'm saying? As you grow in grace, things could get added in that are further down on the list of priorities. So, one, make a list of obligations and responsibilities. Two, put in order of priority according to the Bible. Number three, give to each the time it requires. Now, this is a little different, but it's in the same vein. Set the time for each. All right? Set the time for each. Every Christian, the first thing when they make their schedule, the first priority ought to be prayer, Bible reading. Prayer, Bible reading. First thing in the morning. It ought to be there. We have a rule in our house. No Bible, no breakfast. That's our rule. Ask my family. If you don't read your Bible, you don't get to eat. Why? Because the Bible says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. How many people know what the mind of Christ is without reading this Bible? Nobody. You've got to read this Bible to know the mind of Christ. If God tells you to have the mind of Christ, you better read this first. And so uh, people say, well, that's, a, that's cruel. No Bible, no breakfast. I'll probably get a call from the CPA. Or, well, no, what is it? Not CPA. What do they call it? CPS or whatever, whatever it's called. I don't know what it's called. 
I'm not inviting a call, by the way, anybody that's listening. But, um, you know, he, he's abusing his children. No Bible, no breakfast. We have to have the mind of Christ. We have to have provisions, so we need to pray. Prayer, Bible reading. First thing on the schedule of every Christian ought to be prayer, Bible reading. First thing. It ought to be a priority. Put it right down there. Um, I, I talked to many a preacher and many, a lot of Christians that one of their favorite times is to get a cup of coffee in the morning. They love people that love coffee. They get a cup of coffee. They sit her down on the table, open up their Bible, and uh, and uh, they start reading and drinking their coffee. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good way if you like coffee to start your morning. Get that cup of coffee, and I don't personally do that. I don't like coffee. I love the smell of it, but I don't like to drink it. And you know, it, it's a. Uh, it's a good thing, you know. So get that Bible and get that coffee and read the Bible and drink your coffee and enjoy the morning. It's a good way to do it. Start out with that Bible reading and prayer. That ought to be set first, those priorities. Um, and someday I'll talk about the schedule more in detail, but I'm just speaking generally tonight to help you. And so I said, number one, number one, make a list of obligations and responsibilities. Number two, look at that list and prioritize it according to the Bible. Number three, give to each the time it requires. Number four, put them in the schedule where they should be. Where they should be. Um, in other words, if you've got a job <laughs> and your boss says you have to be there from nine to five, that's a priority, amen. <laughs> Don't set your schedule for, well, let's see. Uh, uh, I've got to read my Bible and pray, so, well, I don't like to get up early. I, I'll set, I'll set it, the Bible reading prayer for 9, 9 to 10 in the morning. I don't care what the boss says. I'll just show up at 10 at the boss's place. <laughs> that ain't going to work. <laughs> that ain't going to work. You need to adjust your schedule. Yes, it's a priority to fulfill your responsibility to your boss. You're supposed to show up, give eight hours work for eight hours pay. You're supposed to do that. But, put your Bible reading and prayer earlier. All right? So, anyway, just a little example. So set the time for each. After you figure out how much time each one's going to take you, set the time for each. Number five. You ready for this? Three words, live by it. Live by it. You're going to find that's easier to say than do. <laughs> it's easier to say than do. Um, live by it. Or let it be your boss. Let it be your boss. You'll find something too. You'll have less... i got to say this right. I don't want to... Make it sound like I'm anarchist, because I'm not. You'll find you'll have less authority being exercised over you if you'll have a schedule and let it be your boss. What do I mean by that? Children, for example. Children, we try to teach our children to clean your room, brush your teeth, wash your face, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all that. Do your homework. If a child learns to have a schedule to put all those things on it and do them, they would never hear from their parents about doing them. There'd be no, they, would, they wouldn't have that authority over them. But children don't clue into that. It takes them a long time to get this. <laughs> they don't like it when parents get on their case, but guess what? Parents wouldn't get on their case if they had a schedule and put all those things on it and did it. They'd rather, I guess children would rather their parents get on their case. No, they wouldn't. But they still don't get it. We have to teach our young people character. The less, let me say that again, the more you live by schedule, the less authority you'll have over you. Because you're letting your schedule be your boss. Um, you say, well, I don't have time to do it all. Well, you better leave the least important as the leftovers. Because you're going to find out you don't have time to do everything that you think you should do. And God doesn't expect you 
to do everything you think you should do. Now, I'm not saying be lazy and don't do anything. You know that if you've listened. I'm just saying life will be full of things that will try to pull you away from the important things. That's the way the devil works. He does not want you to be what God wants you to be. And the way you're going to accomplish that is if you have a schedule. To, to be a success in life, especially the Christian life, you have to live life on purpose. You have to do things on purpose. Jesus called them his disciples. You say, but we're Christians. No, we should be disciples. Yeah, we're Christians, but we should be disciples. Jesus didn't call them Christians. Look in the Bible sometime. You won't find where Jesus called them Christians. The people at Antioch called them Christians. Remember? At Antioch they called them Christians. And that's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But Jesus called them disciples. You know what disciple means? Disciplined one. Disciplined one. Well, we need to learn from what Jesus says. Not what the people at Antioch said. Be a disciplined one. Be a disciplined one. In other words, uh, live life on purpose. And you're only going to do that if you have a schedule. So live life on purpose. That's what I have for tonight. I hope that helped you. And one word of prayer, and we'll get to our praise and thanksgiving time. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to teach. I love teaching the Bible, and I, I love your people. I'm glad they came and heard and took notes. I pray, dear God, this will have an impact on how they live their lives for the better, of course. So they'll be blessed. And I thank you for blessing them. Please, get all the honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name, thanking you for the King James Bible. Amen. You know, I forgot to pray before we started this, I think. Maybe I didn't. Well, anyway, too late now. All right, let's uh, turn that stream off and uh, get... Uh,